and shout out to Eric for anybody who uh, who knows a little bit about those guys. They are an amazing group of people there. Uh, I'd introduce introduce myself. I'm Brett, uh, podcast host of Daily Mushroom, <laughs> and um, yeah, psychedelics for me have just been a um, a big part of my life recently as I started to use them more in a therapeutic setting. Uh, I've had some very powerful experiences in releasing some of my own trauma around uh, loss and grief, specifically with uh, my mother who passed away 10 years ago. And uh, psil psilocybin therapy specifically has been uh, very impactful in, uh, in helping with that, um, that process. So happy to be here, happy to learn alongside everyone else here. And I would love to take us over to Andrew to tell us a little bit about the, the history uh, of psychedelics. Andrew, uh, I'd like to give you about five minutes here to, to um, share with us what you have from your, your experience of, of being around psychedelics for so long. Sure, thank you. Um, what a great um, opportunity to, to talk and I'm glad you limited it to five minutes because we'd probably be here until the wee hours of the morning. Um, I'm in my past my mid 60s now and I remember I was born in the 50s um, and I remember the early days of hearing about psychedelic drugs and the rise of individuals like Timothy Leary and Ken Kesey and his Mary Pranksters and Kool-Aid acid tests and the hippie movement, Hyde Ashbury and all that kind of thing. And as a kid, I was adventurous, so I explored those spaces too. And um, it's really interesting that currently, if you look today at the psychedelic movement and the interest, there's very little evidence of pushback. But in the turn of the 50s to 60s and in those early days with um, icons like Jimi Hendrix, there was a whole movement of let's break traditions, let's do things differently. And society in North America and Europe was fairly formal. Uh, everybody wore pretty strict masks and there were strict rules and regulations around social etiquette and the way to do things. And society just wasn't ready to bust out. Uh, the other thing, adolescents, you know, adolescents of all generations are pretty reactionary and they poke the adults. So you had these people who were very rigid and had these rules and they were being told their system was broken and we should do it differently. Free love, you know, sex, drugs and rock and roll. And there's a massive pushback, massive mm -hmm. suppression of all of the things that could have emerged around what were ongoing medical beginnings of exploration with psychedelic drug treatment. Uh, there was bad press in terms of um, the military industrial complex and manipulation of people and minds. If you go back, look at YouTube and look at historical context, you see things that are good and bad. It was a very messy and crashy time. Some things endured and that psychedelic generation grew up and they put away the, the freedom of the hippie movement, they took on more and more conventionality. I think the idea that we turn into our parents is actually fairly true for every generation. But in, in art and marketing, you could see some of the things from psychedelic experiences being incorporated, particularly in the visual things that you'd see around you. And the interest in psychedelic drugs in psychiatry has really been an infertile ground recently because I'd say since the 1950s, the only true improvements we've had until 1990 were understanding disorders more and trying to improve the same drugs, mainly by reducing side effects. So I could say that the antidepressants, antipsychotics, anti-anxiety drugs that we have now, pretty similar to the ones we had 50 years ago, but the side effects are just better. And a lot of people were not responding to those treatments. And along come psychedelic drugs, which seem to unlock some things. Disinhibition is the wrong word, but let's just say enable people to connect and release things in a way that opens the doors for people who were otherwise inaccessible. An example I gave earlier when we were having the preamble, I talked about PTSD. 
Uh, one of my friends who's a senior psychiatrist in Leiden, Eric van Metten, we were talking the other day about the experience of psilocybin and people who are veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder. And talking about how these veterans for the first time having a psilocybin experience and then psychotherapy were able to kind of unlock the emotional pieces that were tied together. In trauma-informed care, one of the big things is people don't talk much about the trauma because they don't want to trigger people. But with psilocybin, uh, these people started talking about things themselves who had been in treatment for years and never done this. So you can see some real potential for moving pieces in the mind. One of the things that happened is that we understood that maybe these drugs were aiding us in opening up some brain plasticity. So going to the biological side of things, there is evidence that when you take psychedelic drugs, it may enable some more rewiring to go on that wouldn't go on with conventional approaches. We're very much interested in brain plasticity and it's the environment that changes the brain. The environment can be drugs and it can be experiences. With psychedelic augmented psychotherapy, you got that interplay of a, a chemical catalyst together with the playings of the mind and the brain that in the right supportive environment can lead to real progress. A lot of the problems we talk about, depression, anxiety disorders, including PTSD, and the things that lead us to addiction have their roots in early trauma. Um, many of you will know my friend Gabor Mate, who's Vancouver-based, who's worked in this space initially with ayahuasca and other things. He talks a lot about early trauma. And psychedelics seem to be a window into trying to open up a way for individuals to themselves with guidance deal with that. And I think that probably relates to why it's effective in palliative care as well with these tough existential questions. And I'll leave it there for now. I look forward to the conversation continuing. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I'd also like to uh, shout out to everybody who is along with us as an attendee. If you guys have any questions, we're gonna do a Q and A at the end. So as questions are coming up, just fire them in the chat and then we'll uh, we'll grab them at the end there. Uh, thanks again, Andrew. And if you could tell us just uh, just briefly as well, the role that the cannabis pathway has played towards uh, legalization of, and you know, Timothy, you can jump in on this one afterwards as well and elaborate. Um, what's, what's the path there and how is the path of psychedelics following along there? What are the parallels? Okay, you want me to comment on that, Brad? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, it's very interesting contrasting cannabis and um, psychedelics because those of us who work in the area conventionally uh, looking at paths to legalization have been quite surprised by how the process has gone forward. But cannabis has always been viewed as uh, a milder substance. Um, less scary than the idea of a psychedelic experience. So many people have tried various forms of cannabis over the years. And as time has gone by, this has become um, something that's viewed as a relatively safe, accessible substance, acceptable for recreational use. Medical use of uh, marijuana and cannabis products was legalized earlier than the radical move of the Canadian government legalizing cannabis. We know that cannabis is effective in helping people deal with um, anxiety and depression. We also know that cannabis products can trigger things that are harmful in some people. Um, and the, pocket, the, the problem with cannabis is, um, you know, the benefits are, are clear, but the problem is it's not regulated very well. Um, there was a rush to legalization. Um, you know, and it amuses me to think that maybe Justin and his friends wanted to be able to smoke cannabis legally. So the, the whole caucus was interested in moving it forward because um, uh, Jean Chrétien, former prime minister of Canada, when asked, what are you going to do in your retirement? Famously said, maybe, I don't, I don't know, maybe I'll stay at home and smoke a doobie. <laughs> so, you know, there's been a movement in society towards, okay, this is all right. And there's a whole movement in the addiction field, recognizing that legalization is probably a good way to open pathways to deal with addiction problems. 
But cannabis can trigger um, panic disorder and it can trigger psychosis, particularly in young people who may have a vulnerability there. Um, cannabis legalization for medical use, okay, then following on recreational use, and everybody was like opening shops, boutique things, different potencies and strains. And the government legalized edible, uh, legalized uh, smokables before edibles. And you think about the whole thing about health and lung disease, it wasn't worked out very well. And it's been a bit of a mess in the business end of things, as well as the use end of things in terms of harms. But legalization of cannabis actually paved the way. So looking at stepwise legalization, I think there is a big move towards legalization of psilocybin and other psychedelic drugs. I think it will evolve that way. Uh, some of us think it must be done more carefully because the potential damage, vulnerable people taking psychedelics outside a supervised space and without really good knowledge, it has a potential to do harm. That plasticity that works positively can work negatively and you can get people with uh, post psychedelic experiences that are traumatic and remain. Uh, in the old parlance, it would be called having flashbacks and some of the drug induced psychosis problems, for example, can last a long time. Right. But um, yeah, I think we're looking at a very different beast when we look at psychedelics and legalization. Yeah, and this is a, a perfect segue now into the industry involvement. Uh, with companies like Entheon Biomedical working with DMT assisted therapy. So I'd love to call on Timothy to talk about uh, what you're up to there with Entheon. Totally. Um, I guess just following from where Andy, uh, what Andy just spoke on. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing seeing the movement of cannabis legalization come largely on the heels of a mush, uh, push towards medicalization. Um, I, for one, am in favor of cognitive liberty, you know, so consenting adults seeking to expand their minds and, you know, do internal work on themselves. Um, and I really do think that, you know, given the relative harms that we're seeing through the data with psychedelics, um, I can see how that could be a net benefit to society if psychedelics were eventually legalized to the extent that people could elect to take them. That being said, you know, I do think in certain contexts, uh, such as the one that we're focusing on at Entheon, there is a medical necessity to having uh, certain cautionary measures put in place within a highly medicalized system uh, for those that are suffering from potentially very fatal treatment resistant forms of drug addiction, um, especially where misdiagnosis, mistreatment, and especially re-traumatization may ultimately lead to a scenario that not that doesn't necessarily alleviate them of their existential distress, which is, I love that you said that, Valerie. I think that's a, that's a feature of this sort of this life that can permeate not only when it comes to mortality, but also when it comes to the day-to-day -day features of trying to live in a world that may be distressing or oppressive. Um, yeah, the last thing that we want to do is be a bit flippant about these very powerful drugs that can ultimately be super transformative, but as Andy mentioned, super trait amplifying. Um, that neuroplasticity, when not properly put in context, can result in not just ego dissolution, but ego inflation. And I have witnessed firsthand certain instances where a person not very directed in their psychedelic use has gone into a form of psychosis that results in them thinking that they have an unusual channel of insight to the universe and it makes themselves essentially, I guess, um, it, yeah, un unquestionably right about certain things. So I do think there are certain harms that we'd like to uh, negate or avoid. Um, and so where Entheon exists is on the premise of there being a high medical need for those that do suffer from uh, potentially deadly forms of addiction, uh, such as is the case with uh, a large portion of uh, substance use disorder sufferers who, by virtue of just the time of immersion and the number of failed attempts at drug treatment, have deemed themselves treatment resistant. Um, that is just a simple reality for those that sort of enter, enter and exit out of the drug treatment system multiple times. There aren't really many options that are uh, escalations beyond that. Um, and so we often see a revolving door type of treatment. Um, so where Entheon sits is to essentially develop drugs that are, you know, borrowing from or relying on the transformational potential of psychedelic drugs, 
um, but doing so in such a way that we envision as being the safest safest approach possible. Um, understanding that uh, that drug uh, drug uh, addiction sufferers often do suffer from pretty intense traumatic um, traumatic experiences that might be part of their life narrative. The notion of putting someone into potentially a very activating six to eight hour long psychedelic session really does pose some potential threats and some potential negative consequences, given that the, the action of psychedelics isn't one of pure symptom management, or it's not just the alleviation of distress through a beautiful spectrum of kaleidoscopic colors, but rather it is um, a product of actually addressing, confronting, diving into, sometimes viewing very difficult subject matter from an alternative perspective, thereby seeing some way of releasing it or having a new perspective that ultimately can be very freeing. But th the fact exists that sometimes there will be dealing with very difficult subject matter that can be quite overwhelming. Um, so the approach that Entheon is taking is to use dimethyltryptamine, which we know is a very short acting but powerful psychedelic molecule. Um, and infusing it intravenously, uh, thereby giving us that opportunity to create shorter drug sessions where the potential effects of those drugs can be modulated uh, higher or lower based on the flow of drug that's being delivered. And in the event that there is a medically necessary reason to stop the experience, say if someone is saying, whoa, whoa, not today, I did not anticipate having to address this, um, we can stop the flow of that drug um, and the drug effects will subside within about 15 or 20 minutes. And I know that psychedelics are, the virtue of doing them is to um, go through hell to get to the other side. But the last thing that we wanna do is, uh, I guess, push someone into a hellish place that they're not able to deal with. So um, we are actually, uh, we announced some really, uh, in our estimation, really uh, super encouraging news today where our clinical trial uh, was just approved by the Dutch Ethics Board in the Netherlands. Uh, we're conducting a phase one clinical trial. It's a placebo-controlled, uh, single ascending dose, double-blinded uh, study looking at pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of DMT, uh, developing its safety profile. Um, but another thing that we're really interested in, uh, because addiction and psychedelics are so elusive, um, we're really trying to understand some of the other variable components that might dictate whether a person is a better responder to psychedelics. And looking at the brain activity that takes place during the psychedelic experience, to really I try to understand what features of that drug experience we're using EEG, that's electroencephalogram, to measure the brain activity within that person as they come into their drug experience. And we have some signals that we're pursuing that might be related to this uh, feature of the psychedelic experience called entropy. Uh, to really understand at what doses entropy is greatest and um, at what doses uh, DMT is safe. And so uh, we're super excited to announce the approval of that trial. And um, yes, I think we're all rowing in the same boat, which is ultimately um, helping to, I guess, inform the public of the potential benefits of psychedelics to really develop out that empirical objective basis of understanding what psychedelics are, what they do, where are they safe and where are they effective. And I do think that in, in all respects, the generation of that data, I think is a net positive to the entirety of the psychedelic movement as we petition to give access to uh, people that are in need and in ex explicit medical need of these things. Um, some of the more recent developments about the SAP program are premised on that notion of psychedelics generally have a history of safe use and um, have potential for effect. And I think it's a part of industry uh, to help bolster that position of data, bolster that position of information that can inform legislators and regulators that, hey, you know, there are all these pockets of information uh, mushrooming up now that do speak to the general um, efficacy and safety of these drugs. Maybe we should take a more lenient view uh, towards how we regulate and look at these things. So yeah, super excited to be within the space with so many uh, wonderful and uh, compassionate people. Fantastic. Thank you, Timothy. And congratulations on the, uh, the clinical trial going through there. I can't wait to, to follow along with that. Uh, let's hear a little bit from, from David there as well. Uh, David, would you like to add anything on to uh, Entheon's mission and purpose there? Yeah, definitely. Um, Tim su summed up Entheon's mission quite well, but I think to, to Andy's point and the conversation around 
cannabis and how you know we as a community are moving <clears throat> psychedelics forward, it is an interesting question, right? Because we have a lot of legacy communities coming out of the, the 60s and 70s, <clears throat> those who had used psychedelics for therapeutic use and who uh, you know, were encouraged by <clears throat> positive studies and scientific results. And then as Andy went into the sort of clamp down on research and then this <clears throat> resurgence sort of beginning in the 90s, culminating into what we see today. And you know, we had groups like MAPS forming who are, who've been very influential in driving things forward. And now we're at this place where there's been this <clears throat> rush of capital, rush of interest um, into, the, into the field of psychedelics. And, you know, sometimes it can see, seem like there's some disparate groups and what's everyone working toward? <clears throat> what is the common aim here? But I think, yeah, Tim, Tim outlined well, it's like, you know, private industry um, is, is driving a lot of scientific research um, forward. That in turn is um, influencing media which is then, you know, starting to speak about, talk about psychedelics, therapeutic benefits. Uh, quite a few high profile athletes have, have gotten into the ring and, and now this conversation's flowing, right? And that's what we saw with cannabis as well. It's like this sort of the grassroots movement, the advocacy was always present. Probably <clears throat> the day something becomes illegal, it's like that gr grass movement began, right? And so it's, it sort of culminated in this, in this necessity for, more information, a better understanding um, of, you know, what is the capacity and how do we move forward in, you know, a safe and sober minded uh, fashion to provide, you know, access and availability to those who really uh, require it. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, Valerie and Marsh expanding on, on their perspective and, and learning about, um, you know, how, <clears throat> how that process is unfolding, because, you know, as Theracil's done phenomenal work in, in Canada and they're, their advocacy, um, you know, they've, you know, petitioned to the point of, of, uh, of swaying Health Canada, um, you know, in, in a big way. And that's, uh, that does serve us all um, and anyone who wants to get these medicines to the people. So I'm uh, looking forward to that. Right on. I think we're all looking forward to it. Yeah. So, Valerie, we'd love to, uh, we'd love to hear from Valerie here first, Dr. Valerie Masuda here. Um, uh, I, I mean, I, this might be a conversation for another time, but because David brought it up, uh, the Section 56 exemptions that were just shut down uh, by the health minister, <laughs> maybe we could shed a little bit of light on that. But Valerie, we'd love to hear uh, a little bit more about the work that you're doing with My Community Journey, uh, Roots to Thrive, and this most recent nine-person legal psilocybin uh, group therapy. So I am... Um... It going to ignore the section 56 in the SEP right now because that is like a full hour discussion on its own. Um, so, uh, you know, I came to this, um, the psychedelic space um, because I was really struggling with a very young woman who was dying um, and she had so much existential distress. She had uncontrollable pain. She had been to um, tertiary pain medic, uh, tertiary units. She had every conceivable medication. She had every conceivable intervention for her pain. And she spent most of her time curled up weeping and unable to articulate, you know, um, the fact that she was dying. She just, she was dying, but she just was in such a horrible state. We could not manage anything with her. So I was struggling with this patient and I just, happened to um, uh, be invited to uh, sort of just a meet and greet with um, the CEO of Theracil and Bruce Tobin, who, who is the founder, um, with some of our Roots to Thrive people and uh, having a discussion about psilocybin. And, and, and they had um, helped the first patient achieve um, a Section 56 exemption. So I just said, you know, I've read a lot about the psychedelic space. I didn't realize that psilocybin was actually um, something we could obtain for treating patients, but I have no other option with this patient. So, you know, we ended up applying for a section 56 and within 24 hours having it granted. So this is the early days. And uh, we treated her like two days later and, you know, her, the change in her during, during the sit, um, I was there with Bruce uh, Tobin and she was, she really had a very difficult journey and she really would not articulate what, what her journey was about. And we thought it was a failure because she just said, I want out of this. I don't want to deal with it. I feel high. I feel stoned. I don't want this. 
Yeah. And we sort of had a, a conversation with the family and saying, you know, we tried our best, but we'll see what happens. And the next day, 180 degree turnaround, she could speak about dying. Her pain levels went way down. We had to you know, discontinue so many medications just over two days because um, she just didn't need them anymore. And then she was able to connect with friends and family she had actually disconnected from because she was in such a horrible space and able to say goodbye to them um, before she died. And this was for me, a, a, a total change. And oh my God, before we used to take people and put them into a terminal, terminal sleep when they just could not cope with living, when living was so, so intolerable because of their existential distress, we used to just put them to sleep until they died. Um, and more recently, we've had medical assistance in dying. And so, you know, certainly there are people that come to medical assistance in dying because not so much of distress, it's almost like a practical decision, but I see a number of people come to medical assistance in dying from a space of true distress. Um, and then there are people who just, they are unable to approach their dying because of many, many reasons, but the people I see most distressed is this lack, lack of congruency between the person who they see themselves as and who they want their family and friends to see them and their family and friends want to see this person and the person who they are becoming. Now, this is their authentic person and this is the person that they, you know, uh, presented to the world, right? This is, the, this is who they want to be perceived at. That could be the breadwinner of the family, the guy that chops wood in the back, the mother, the person who picks up their kids from daycare. And so when people lose the ability because of disease that's progressive to do those things that they feel made themselves the person they are, they lose their feeling of purpose and life becomes meaningless. And so, you know, what we do with our, with our, our treatment is try to I bring people to the realization of who their authentic self is. And the only way they can do that is actually in a group um, we found. Um, Roots to Thrive is a, is a I think you've, you've actually had Shannon Danes on the program before, who's talked in depth about Roots to Thrive um, and where it's coming from, is uh, teaching people really who they are in their authentic self and in a community of practice. So they can test that with other people who are much like themselves. You don't have people that are saying, no, you should be like this, you should be like that. These people are coming together and witnessing each other's authentic self. And they use ketamine as a, a psychedelic to open those doors. But the, um, the group is so powerful. And when I um, uh, learned about this and then Actually, I had to uh, be enrolled as a patient so I could really learn about this from a patient perspective. I thought the power of the group is so important um, that we can heal in a group. And our sense of authenticity is, is so, it's so, uh, there's such a disconnect with our current uh, society. Um, and this is a way we can reconnect with ourselves and relationally with others. Um, so what we did is we brought a cohort of nine patients and they all had section 56 exemptions and we brought them together and uh, we went, we went through an accelerated Rusothar program, which was six weeks instead of 12 weeks with a psilocybin treatment in the middle. And um, the, the, and we actually are just in the process of, we've just submitted a manuscript to Frontiers in psych, Psychology, um, looking at this as a case uh, report. And so um, all the participants, or I'd say seven, eight out of nine of the participants found one of the most uh, effective forms of the treatment were actually being in the group. Mm. And being all coming from the same place, we all have life limiting illness, this is where we're at. And there was no pretense of having to act differently to, in order to um, show themselves as somebody different other than their authentic self. <coughs> so it validates who you are and it brings purpose to your life again. Um, the psilocybin was, uh, we basically brought them together. This was the first time certainly um, in Canada 
uh, that um, psilocybin has been given in a group. Um, there has been some group therapy in preparation integration, but really we couldn't find any data to suggest in North America there has been group administration of psychedelic. Um, it went really well uh, and um, uh, with the psilocybin treatment. And uh, we had really good results with a lot of people's anxiety and um, depression scales coming quite uh, coming down. We did have some uh, learnings from it. We did have not a hundred percent of people had a positive experience. So you know, going forward in a, a quality assurance uh, process, we're looking at changing, making changes to our next cohort, which will start at the end of this month with another nine patients this time through the SAP process. Right on. That's great. Thank you so much, Valerie. And now we can hear from a participant that was in this first uh, cohort here. So Marsha, tell us about your experience uh, there and, and what you gleaned from it. Um, it was an incredible experience. First off with the, um, the, the, the previous, evenings leading up to the actual psilocybin sessions we all each got a chance to know the fellow people who were involved in it got to know the facilitators that were involved in it and um i've had that was my second uh legal session and the safety that's created when you're in an environment when you don't know what it is that you're going to be addressing because um going into psychedelics you often get what you need not what you want um, and it's, you have to be prepared for that and to create the safety net that allows you to go, to be able to, even if parts of you are feeling resistance, I've not really, I'm pretty open-minded person. I'm a very adoptable person. So I've never felt any of that, but from talking with other people who have been in this, the same similar situation, if your body does feel resistance, just part of your brain can know that you're in a sense of safety Part of, you can go with that. You can allow yourself to go, okay, I am safe. Even if you don't fully, fully envelop that, you can still allow yourself to go, okay, you know what? There's people around here. There's nurses, doctors, psychiatrists. They're not do, they're, you're not doing something that's um, irresponsible. You're doing, uh, I, was, I did it for, the, for my, I, when I was listening to Valerie talk, she actually provided insight to me why I haven't felt as much um, end of life distress that I did um, once I got the cancer, because I brought my depression had gotten so bad leading up to my cancer diagnosis that I had already brought myself to very close to the edge of death. So I was, I was already kind of more comfortable with that than um, I was comfortable with, but that allowed me to be able to not, um, get so much anxiety around that and why it is that it's like that I've been that has not been the biggest factor I've definitely got more comfortable in the use of psychedelics with um, having conversations around death mortality um, but it's mostly helped me um, more than anything else and I've suffered from depression all of my life like severe depression that nothing nothing that talk therapy whatever forms of therapy that I've tried in the past just has not been able to help me address to what it is that I needed to uncover, discover why it is that was leading to depression. And, and um, the insights I gleaned from it was just, I mean, I literally discovered what my own Achilles heel was, what my, like physically in my body, when they say your body holds a trauma, it's just like it came up in my right ankle, in my right Achilles heel. And I was like, that insight has allowed me to be able to um, change relationships, um, to be able to just be able to, to have more of an understanding of it is what I've been dealing with and why I have not been able to change things that's needed to help me with the depression. And um, yeah, and, and the depression's not fully gone away. But um, right now, just giving everything that's going on, I still deal with depression, but it's not to the extent, not nearly, it's a quarter of what it was, what it was in the past. Mm -hmm. And 
I now know I have more understanding of just how to help myself and how to the people that I have in my life now, the support systems that I have in my life, I can, I can articulate to them, this is what I'm dealing with. Because before I couldn't even articulate what it is that I'd been experiencing all my life and, and just felt so stuck in. And um, so I've only had two and I have my exemption until July 2nd of this year. And I definitely, would definitely want to have more psilocybin sessions. Just if they're invaluable for teaching me about what it is that I'm mentally dealing with, emotionally dealing with. It's like in, uncovering my own internal world. And your therapist can only do so much to help you. And, um, and I'm grateful for my counselor that I have. Um, but this allows me to do, the, do my own work because the therapist can only do so much for you. They, they can ask questions, they can tease, they can pull and you're like, oh God, we're doing this. And you're like, yeah, we are doing this. But the psilocybin is just, it's been incredible for me. And I, I've never been become so passionate about something in my life to, to have the proper education out there for access for everybody to be able to, who, can, who, who needs it. Because what this can do, it's like antidepressants are not the solution. It's like, yeah, to me, psychedelics and whatever DMT, MDMA, ketamine, however you approach it, it's just like doing it in a supportive, educated way, I think is the best thing you can do for yourself, for your mental health. Very, very well said, Marsha. Thank you for that. And uh, I would love to have to talk to everyone here. I find all of your stories and uh, your mission so inspiring. Uh, we do have to keep this uh, tight a little bit here. So I'd love to just quickly move into our Q&A. We got about nine minutes left in the hour here. So uh, we have a question from Susan here. Uh, this would probably be, this would maybe be a question for Andy. When will it be legal in California? Um, uh, however, Oakland, uh, sorry, Oakland and Santa Cruz have defunded police in this area. Sorry, I'm not really understanding the question here from. It's, a, it's at the bottom. It's about the equivalent of psilocybin and ketamine and other things. Wow. Um, you know, it's really early days. Ketamine is a dissociative anesthetic. It works in a different way than um, the psychedelics. Uh, it's not a true psychedelic. It opens things up a bit and people have had benefit from it. I think that the hallucinogens like psilocybin, DMT um, are going to be much more effective. Ketamine is possible because it's legal and accessible. But I think when the, the door is opened, the bravery of physicians like Valerie to go into that space and actually try and help based on hearing something when people are in really great difficulty. And then you hear, Marsha, I mean, my heart goes out to you. You're so beautiful in your sharing. I'm totally moved by it. And your voice is what makes the difference. I mean, existentially, you have been through these things. And one, one thing I think that you will know is that um, in counseling and psychiatry, there's always been a distance between the therapist and the client or patient. When it comes to psychedelic augmented therapy, that distance dissipates. And it's sometimes um, my psychiatry colleagues who've done this therapy, they tell me they're so moved and they're so connected. And it's the patient doing the work for herself or his self. And they're there for safety and, and to be a, a guide if possible. And as Valerie said, wow, I have no idea. It seemed not to work and the next day all those things fell into the right place for that young woman. And your story is very, very much like that, right? It's like giving somebody a key to a lock, letting them open the door and see what's inside, going through whatever difficulty. And for many people, probably not for everybody, but for many people coming out the other side, ketamine can help that way. But I think psilocybin and other psychedelics, DMT and so on will go further. One thing I'll say, Valerie, you know, um, and Marsha, I've heard from people doing therapy, particularly in the Netherlands, 
that when there have been a number of people doing therapy separately at the same time, when they've come into the same relaxing space to cool down, there's been some magic coming out of the conversation between those clients. There has been a group therapy component just happening because they're all in the space and they're sharing. And there's a real marvelous thing there. So we're on this webinar today, there are things that are emerging that are not known. And uh, there are so many things we can talk about. You know, uh, Tim talking about the duration of the MT effects, wanting to manage. A lot of people who don't know are talking about psycholytic or psychedelic. Are we just microdosing? Are we, it's a, it's a place to be explored. And until it's possible to do it more, uh, we won't know what's optimal. But Marsha, your voice is such a wonderful thing, like a butterfly in the room today. It's just, <laughs> you, you just brought the reality to us. Thank you so much, love. Wonderful. And, yeah, I completely agree. And uh, Susan Sampson, who asked the question, I was just going to add um, for Susan to keep her, keep her eyes open on the Oregon situation, which would be a closer jurisdiction to her. Um, things are moving pretty fast down there. And hopefully, you know, within within a quick time frame, uh, more availability will be provided. And that would also tie into Laura's question here as well. Uh, are there ways for Americans to travel to Canada for treatment? Um, I can't speak to that, but I think, yeah, there are a lot of options in the United States that are popping up um, with like ketamine, especially to go and try out. And I have to say um, that, you know, just people thinking that they can just walk in, take some psilocybin and they'll be, have a life-changing event. It is, this is not the thing. And I have actually seen really bad outcomes with people thinking they could do it on their own because it's like, you know, you open your Pandora's box, stuff comes out. And if you don't have the support of the safety of the container at the time of your journey, nor the ability to integrate this because it, it talks about a different perspective. Your brain now has a different perspective on life, but unless you follow that perspective, you can very quickly fall back into the same old thought processes that you had before. So um, this is why it's so important to do this, these things in part of programming. It's called neuroplasticity. We now have an empty slate but we need to program it. And that's where the therapist is so important. And um, if, if you're going to do this, you know, take the mushrooms on your own, you know, you're not in a safe space. You're not, you're not necessarily going to have a safe outcome. So really it's not just about um, legalizing psychedelics. It's about legalizing psychedelic medicine and getting the infrastructure up and running for people to have access to therapists instead of, going into the underground and paying a bunch of money for somebody to sit with them and then disappear with their money, mm -hmm. right? It, this, is, this is about using it for, um, for mental, mental health, maybe mental wellness and microdosing or whatnot, but I think you know, this is so new that we have to be careful the way we approach things. We can't go back to you know, bad trips you know, behind the mall kind of thing. We, we need to be mm -hmm. looking at this with respect. Yeah, yeah I, I really I really applaud what you say, Valerie. A practical piece of commentary on this is that um, despite that sage advice, people will go out and do this on their own. They will try. And one of the things we learned back many decades ago was if you are going to explore this, the safest place to do it is in a place where you have people you know and trust and love who have the experience. Uh, when people that you don't know claim to have experience, it, there's a lot of vulnerability. So the best idea is to do this in approved, safe places with people with really clear experience. But if you go on these adventures on your own, for goodness sake, make sure you have a safety net of really supportive people. And if you can, experience people that you can really trust. But we're not recommending that. It's just if that's your path, make sure the safety net is in place. But I agree completely with what Valerie says. I think we all uh, resonate and share that same philosophy and message there. So that's that's it. We got one minute left here uh, on the hour. Thank you to everyone for being here.
Uh, I'd love to just quickly go through, can everybody just give me maybe one word or a short sentence of what they see as just the, the future of psychedelic therapy? And let's start with Marsha. <laughs> um, I just want education. Just get education around it. Hopefully people can do it in a legal space, but if you don't do it in a legal space, have yourself educated. Don't mix it with other substances. Bad idea. Just educate yourself and support yourself in the most amazing way possible. Education. I love it. Timothy. Yeah. Um, just before I give my sentence, I just want to thank everyone for such beautiful and articulate sort of uh, explanations of what they, what they believe in and what they've gone through. Um, and sort of, yeah, a really beautiful insight that I've, I think that I've gotten from this is that I see psychedelics as having all the capacity to help shatter some of those illusions of expectation that can be sort of contributing to the sense of existential distress that I think permeates all of our lives to some degree. Um, and I think in doing so, we can access, as Marsha, you described, some of the inner wisdom that you know, only we can tease out of ourselves. And I think it's that, you know, that end product of testimonial that says, having gone through this experience, like I've really come to a true understanding of what makes me tick, what makes me ticked off. And like, I know how to love myself best and function within society and have relationships and have love for myself, others and society at large. I think that's the most sort of like promising area of potential, not in just treating these medical conditions, but the ultimate outcome of what the sort of person that comes out of these things with, uh, who that person is, I think that's the hugely promising thing for society. And I love that, uh, you know, that's what we're talking about. Beautiful. David. Yeah, I, I hope, I think for the, for the whole community and, and industries and whoever's involved, sort of that respect and, and reconnection like was talked about here tonight and um, Valerie spoke of very well, um, you know, about and, you know, utilizing the learnings of, <clears throat> of the medicines and these higher intelligence, you know, to, to create a more, a more cohesive uh, society. It's a, it's a time of fracture. And I think, I don't think it's, um, incidental that psychedelics are showing up um, now in the way that they are. And I think, I think we, we need these medicines and um, yeah, I just hope they're administered in, um, in a positive way and uh, people find what they're, what, the, what they need. Right on. Valerie, closing, closing comments. Um, I think psychedelics, uh, it's an, a new frontier in that we now have the capacity for healing even if we are unable to cure um, disease, we can still heal people from the inside. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, that is the, the biggest take home message. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, very well said. Uh, and before we get Mr. Andrew Greenshot to round it off here, uh, I would just like to acknowledge all of you for taking the time here and educating us uh, with your expertise and your personal stories and vulnerability and experience. I'm super grateful for everyone here spending the time to talk with us and uh, to all the participants as well. Uh, people listening along, thank you for being here. Uh, Andrew, close us off here. Thank you. Uh, thanks to everybody. It's been a wonderful, heartfelt session. Marsha, particularly to you for your authenticity and your experience. I think uh, Valerie is an example of... Um, the new physicians in the mental health space who are going to actually intimately connect and do good work in relationship. This is all about authenticity. As Tim said, the area is mushrooming out with information and experience. Watch the space. It's going to be very colorful. And thanks to my dearly beloved friend, Dorian Leslie for the Daily Mushroom and Brett for the wonderful podcasts. This is a space to watch and the Daily Mushroom is a great way to watch it. I'm so impressed by the, the breadth of the people who've attended here from all over the world. And uh, it's been a real privilege for me to be here. Thanks to everybody. Beautiful. Well, thanks again, everyone. Uh, I'd like to just leave it at that. Thanks to Entheon Biomedical, uh, everyone that's working on the Daily Mushroom Project. and. Um, everything that Valerie and, uh, and Marsha are a part of over there at My Community Thrives, Root to Thrive, My Community Journey. Uh, 
<laughs> and you're under a bunch of different names there. We'll be closely following along. My with community you. journeys. <laughs> My community journey. Okay, we'll go with that one. Um, and uh, I would love to have all of you on. David and I know have already done a podcast, but to get that full conversation and we can really dig deep, I invite you all to, to come on and, and talk with me whenever you like. Great. I'd love to have a conversation with Valerie on the podcast with you. That would oh, I'd really God. like that. Okay. Set it up. Good. Good one. Yeah. Okay, everybody. Thank you so yeah. much. It's been great. Pleasure. Thank you, everybody. So lovely to meet you all and hear from you. I yeah, I look forward to hearing more about everybody. Okay. Yes. Thanks.